school year has been underway for a while now. Um, those classroom routines and expectations have already been established and the beginning of this school year is starting to fade away. It's time to start taking those pre-assessments that have been taken in those content areas and we're gonna start looking at how we wanna use that data. How do we want to take that and start supporting our students the best way possible? And one of the main things that we can do is start to use that data to form small groups. So we're gonna talk about how we can make sure that we're forming small groups and that they are being effective and that they're running in the classroom successfully. There's several reasons why you might wanna form small groups. You might want to run your classroom using centers or you want, might want to have different stations and areas in the room that the students can work in. Either way, it's wonderful to have your students work in a small group setting as opposed to always teaching in a whole group setting. It's important to have a strategy behind the way that you're teaching and the way that you're providing support for your students. Okay, so the first step is using the data to actually form your groups. So I take uh, whatever benchmark or pre-assessment that your school initially does at the beginning of the year. You look at the data, you analyze it, and you figure out what students will work best in what groups. You wanna look at the strategies that they're lacking. You wanna look at the strategies that they have already mastered. And from there, you can start grouping the students in a way that's going to support their learning. So you wanna look at the data, but once you really start to get to know your students, you'll also figure out their strengths and weaknesses aside from what the data tells you. So you always wanna keep in their, you all, so you always wanna keep their daily habits and um, how they're doing in your class as a resource as well. You don't want to uh, form your group solely on data. That's okay in the beginning because you're just getting to know your students, but later on you might see that those groups are starting to shift because students are learning and they're grasping content that you are teaching. So it's totally okay to start changing those groups for the better. Aside from using data, you can also use classroom data. So if you have students do an entrance slip or an exit slip, on a daily basis, you're always assessing your students. So use the information that you get from them to form small group instruction. For example, you might have a lesson that you taught main idea and you've taught it for two days. And after those two days, you have students do some type of activity where they work by themselves on their own and then you will use that data to see who has got the skill and who didn't and whoever hasn't mastered the skill at that point you know that those are the students that you need to pull to provide them extra support before you actually assess them at the end of the unit Groups are not final, they're not static. Groups are dynamic. They should be changing all the time. And for the better, you want to make sure that your students are progressing. Therefore, your groups are gonna progress as well. And the interest in the topics of each group is gonna change. You want to make sure that your groups are always progressing as well. And the focus for the groups are ever changing. Don't get stuck on having one group of students work together all year. You want to keep changing things up. You want to keep it engaging. You want to keep it interesting. I always assign my students to two different groups, the home group and the away group. So let's talk about the home group first. The home group is basically based on student performance. So this is how students are working at an individual level um, based on their ability. And these are what we call homogeneous groups. So all the students in the group are pretty much on the same page. They're learning at the same pace. They've mastered the same skills. So because these groups are based on ability level, whatever tasks you give the students, they're expected to complete it effectively and efficiently. Therefore, they're all working on the same thing. This makes it easier for you to pass things out 
and to differentiate your instruction. Having this home group also makes it easier to tailor each group to its own individualized instruction. For example, I could give all of my students the same reading passage, but work with each group on a different skill, depending on the way that they are grouped and the ability level of each group. So if my red group is struggling more in main idea, then I can tailor the instruction for that reading passage I can focus on main idea with that group. Whereas my blue group, they might have already mastered main idea. Maybe they're having trouble drawing some inferences. So then I will work towards getting my students in the blue group to master inferencing. Having this home group helps me focus on students that really are challenged and they're really struggling with certain material. So that way I could pull this group and work with those groups a little bit more, whereas my groups that have already mastered certain skills, they can do work independently. And I know that they are working successfully because it's something that they have already mastered or something that I know that they're working towards. Whereas students that are still struggling, I could work with those individual students in a small group and tailor the instruction that they need. The next group that I like to create in my classroom is the away group. And this group is basically a mixture of student ability, which you might think of as the Kagan style, when students are sitting at their desk or sitting in small groups or heterogeneous groups. This means that students are performing at different levels. So the group consists of students who have mastered certain skills and students who have not mastered those same skills. This way students are able to work together and help each other any way that they can. This type of grouping ensures that all students are learning and students are learning at different levels, but they're all collaborating and working together, regardless of the ability level of each student in the group. This type of group is more effective during whole group discussion. So it's a good idea to maybe um, seat your students in the classroom based on their heterogeneous groups. I like to do my away groups when we're having whole class discussions or if we're doing a jigsaw activity. Away groups are a great way for students to challenge each other, a great way for students to watch other students um, think. I love to use away groups because there's always a student in the away group who is a leader. There's always a student in the away group that automatically just models their thinking to their classmates. And for students who are still struggling, this is a great way for them to watch their classmates and try to tailor their own learning based off of them. If you ever wanna combine both groups, you can use both the away and home group in a jigsaw activity. I love to start off with having students sit in their home group and I give that group a specific task and then I have those students complete the task and then they come back together in their away group and everybody in the group shares their own part of the task. For example, you might have a group that has to do a little bit more inferencing and drawing conclusions on the same particular text, whereas another group might identify those key details. So when they get to their away group, they're gonna put all the pieces together and it's gonna fit like a jigsaw. So why does this work? I found that this is the best way to create small groups in the classroom and to add some dynamic with the structure of how my classroom is ran. This type of teaching using these small groups is a creative way to get students engaged and a way to keep them constantly learning and on their toes. Students are engaged in rich discussion and in creative activities. Data is used to pretty much help the teacher formulate groups that are going to support the students learning in the end. 
Having small groups is a great way to analyze student performance and to keep track of behaviors and academics that students are struggling in. Just as students are changing, groups are changing, the data changes. So we have to make sure as teachers that we are always abreast to what our student performance is so that we can make sure we're always supporting them. It is our job to meet them where they are and they should always be moving forward. So we need to stay on top of each and every one of our students. Regardless of how hard that may be, it's our duty to make sure that we're providing them with the resources that they need. So knowing our students and their struggles and their weaknesses and their successes and their strengths is only going to help them in the end become successful in our classroom. It's our job to meet our students where they are and then challenge them from there. So having these groups is a great way to do that. What challenges are you facing as a teacher when it comes to forming small groups in your classroom? What are some things that you do with your small group? Please like, share, comment below. We would love to hear from you. From my teacher apple to yours, have fun creating.